I am April Gallant, Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Smith College Museum of Art, and it was my great honor and pleasure to have been the organizing curator of the exhibition Drawn to Excellence, the show which has brought us all here today. I would be remiss, however, not to acknowledge the ultimate curator of the exhibition, who is the collector who assembled these wonderful drawings and has so generously allowed us to show them for the semester. Um, and I'd like to add my personal thanks to her for this incredible act of generosity. I'm particularly pleased to acknowledge the key role of our next speaker, Suzanne Foltz McCullough, in the organization of the exhibition, and to be able to publicly thank her for her invaluable contributions and to formally introduce her. I have long admired Suzanne's work as a curator, and it has been such a wonderful experience to be able to work directly with her and to benefit from her insight and experience. Smith College is proud to count Suzanne Foltz McCullough as a graduate, and we have been pleased to welcome her back to campus this semester as the Ruth and Clarence Kennedy Professor in Renaissance Studies. This fall, Suzanne is teaching a course on French and Italian drawings from the Renaissance to Romanticism, which draws directly on our special exhibition, as well as SDMA's rich holdings in this area. Suzanne joined the staff of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1975 and earned her doctorate from Harvard University in 1981. She currently serves as the Anne Voigt Fuller and Marion Titus Searle Chair and Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Art Institute. A specialist in French and Italian prints and drawings of the Renaissance and Baroque, Suzanne is the author of numerous articles and exhibition catalogs, among them a scholarly volume of over 700 drawings, Italian drawings before 1600 in the Art Institute of Chicago, published in 1997, which included a newly discovered Raphael. She has a long and rich history of working with private collectors, having organized a number of exhibitions and catalogs on significant Chicago-grown and Chicago-intended drawing collections, including those of Joseph Shapiro, Martin Gecht, Dorothy Edinburgh, Jean and Steve Goldman, Richard and Mary Gray, and Anne Searle Bent. Her talk today about the relationship between collectors and curators will draw directly on those experiences. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Folds McCullough. Oh, it's so good to be here and to have you all here. Thank you, April. It's been such a treat to work with you and let me take you now from the 19th century in England to the present day in a major American metropolis. It is a tremendous privilege to be serving as Ruth and Ke Clarence Kennedy Professor of Renaissance Studies at the moment of the Drawn to Excellence exhibition, drawn from the remarkable collection of a dear and esteemed friend. And I offer my remarks as a tribute to this anonymous collector and with deepest thanks to President Christ Smith College Museum of Art Director Jessica Nickel, Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs April Gallant, Craig Felton, and Martin Antonetti, Rare Book Curator, who has been such a value to Gironi for me. And I have to say, being the Ruth and Clarence Kennedy Professor means a great deal to me, as my two earliest mentors in prints and drawings, Agnes and Betty Mongan, um, I think I'm one of two people who had both women as her professor, uh, traveled to Italy in the 20s with the Kennedys and got their graduate degrees through Smith College. The topic I was given, rival partners, the curator and the collector, as described in the brochure, let me see if I can operate this correctly, there we go, um, notes that private collectors are often informed by personal taste in their acquisitions, while museum curators are guided by collecting policies and institutional budgets, and promises that I will explore how the parameters of the, these potential rivals serve to form mutually beneficial partnerships. Without going into the details of institutional budgets, or trying to define the Art Institute's collecting policies beyond the all-encompassing adage, build on strengths, fill gaps. <laughs> I will recap some of the varied and rewarding partnerships that we have known in Chicago. Three distinct eras and approaches will be explored. 
the first 30 years when curators and collectors were one and the same, the golden years of pure patronage in which collections were built at the Art Institute, and more recent years where private collections have flourished and intertwined with the museum. In particular, we will look at the past decade of publications and exhibitions which have brought private drawings to the public, making an accessible medium more accessible and celebrating the scholarship and the community that drawings generate. And I think the idea of the community is completely uh, evident in the wonderful turnout for this particular symposium and for this particular collector. The story of complex relations between collectors and curators in Chicago begins with the 1921 contract for almost 4,000 European and American drawings given by William Frank Eugene Gurley in memory of his mother on what would have been her 90th birthday. He wrote, I hope to live to see the time when this collection, as large as it is now, will be almost lost in the greater collection of what this will serve as a nucleus. By the time Gurley died 22 years later, leaving another 6,600 drawings, Carl O. Schneewen had been appointed as the first professional curator of prints and drawings and was actively cultivating the acquisition of major drawn masterpieces. So indeed, his collection was almost lost for another two decades. Visually impaired by measles as a child, Gurley graduated in geology from Cornell. You might note the next venue of this exhibition taking a postgraduate European voyage that included seeing old master drawings uh, at the Grosvenor Gallery London in the winter of early 1878. A passionate collector of stamps, Indian artifacts, rocks, and fossils, he joined the gold rush in Colorado, was appointed state geologist and director of the Illinois State Museum of Natural History, joined the faculty of the University of Chicago as professor of geology in 1897, and in 1900 was appointed curator of paleontology of the Walker Museum there. By 1906, he seems to have begun buying drawings from and through Mags Brothers in London, although it's unclear whether he was present at these sales or not. Yet as a curator, he cared deeply about cataloging his collection, often inscribing obscure attributions on the verso of the drawings in pen and ink. Here are two examples of Barocci drawings that uh, come from the Gurley collection. The one on the right of the screen, which is just getting ready to go to St. Louis for the great Barocci exhibition there, is for the deposition um, that we saw so beautifully illustrated yesterday uh, in Perugia. And uh, you can see Mr. Gurley's nasty little mark here. And you can probably guess that the ink is coming through from the inscription on the back. But this is a full-scale cartone, uh, which the artist would have carried in his hand while he was executing the painting. This is very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have more. Um, and you'll notice the drawing on the left of the screen may look very familiar after last night's lecture also. This is a study for the um, Madonna uh, di San Giovanni of 1565, that wonderful small altar um, picture that uh, Barocci made after uh, recovering from his illness as a testimonial to uh, his, his renewed health. And this was a drawing that came in in 1943. Was really unaccession for quite a few years, uh, and we discovered it in 1985. So that was, um, there, there's uh, a reputation for finding great drawings in the Gurley collection. Unfortunately, it sounds sort of terrible to say you're going to look at Gurley drawings in Chicago, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, indeed, um, it's been called the buried treasure on Michigan Avenue. In 1911, Art Institute trustees Kenneth Sawyer Goodman, Clarence Buckingham, and William McKellen McKee established the Department of Prints and Drawings, which Goodman and McKee ran initially, and Clarence Buckingham largely formed with his extensive holdings of old master as well as Japanese prints. The prevailing interest in those years was French art, 
with trustees Martin Ryerson using endowed funds to purchase Odillon Redon's entire printed from the artist's widow in 1920. The key role of charismatic private collectors in the formation of the institution is underscored by the rich legacy of Mrs. Potter Palmer's collection of French Impressionist paintings in her bequest in 1922, including this beloved Degas pastel. It was Carl Schneewen, as I said, the museum's first professional curator, who was hired in 1940 from the Brooklyn Museum, who inaugurated the extraordinary tradition of philanthropy for which Chicago has become famous, enticing Bertha Palmer's daughter-in-law, Pauline Palmer and Margaret Day Blake, to travel with him to New York and abroad. He persuaded them to buy great drawings for the museum directly, creating collections there in their names and foregoing the pleasure of hanging them on their own walls at home. They sought signal images in perfect condition, such as Fragonard's beguiling wash study of the letter, purchased by Margaret Blake in 1945, or Matisse's fauve masterpiece of a nude in a folding chair of 1906 that shows Pauline Palmer picking up where her mother-in-law left off. And the amusing thing about this is the love of the ladies for color and line um, went against the... Uh, man that united them, Potter Palmer Jr., who in fact served as director of the museum for a number of years in the interim period during this era, had a favor uh, for early Renaissance engravings and sculpture, completely different than uh, the brash colors of his, his ladies that surrounded him. Beginning in 1958, Schneewen's apostle and successor, Harold Joachim, continued and expanded that tradition of extraordinary philanthropy, working with Margaret Day Blake for another two decades. Celebrated in an exhibition in 1970 as an example of what an individual can accomplish on behalf of a museum, Margaret Blake's collection of 67 drawings was highly eclectic, spanning from Pisanello's rare study sheet of the Emperor John VIII Paleologus, drawn in 1438, on the left of the screen, to Picasso's fierce Embrace of the Minotaur of 1933. And you'll notice there's another title on the bottom of the screen, uh, which caused some problems for our trustee. Uh, Harold Joachim would go and see Margaret Blake at the end of her life, and... Um, he presented this drawing to her, and she said, oh, no, my accountant says I can't buy anything more for the collection this year. And uh, he came back the next week, his tail between his legs. Why are you so morose, she said. He said, because the trustees say I can't buy it. The, the subject matter is just too racy. And they called it the Embrace of the Meditar, and she said, that does it. I've got to give it. And so <laughs> that's how we got these treasures. <laughs> However, also in 1958, Harold Joachim brought Helen Regenstein into the mix, a recent widow whose husband invented the window, window envelope. Indeed, he managed, Harold Joachim managed to create a friendly rivalry between collectors as one lady would try to match or outshine the other. On the left, you see Mrs. Blake's wonderful Vato, purchased in 1954. And on the right, Mrs. Regenstein's first Vato, bought four years later. In contrast to Margaret Day Blake's wide range of collecting, Helen Regenstein honed in on the French and Italian schools, with an emphasis on the 18th century. Her collection of 82 works was shown in 1974 in galleries that she had renovated for the museum. Here you can see the Regenstein drawing is on the right, and the Blake drawing, uh, bought two years later, on the left. Helen Regenstein continued to build her collection at the museum for over 20 years in a focused fashion, ultimately, surprisingly, veering into the 20th century at the end to help us acquire Juan Miro's kerosene lamp, a 20th century equivalent of a Renaissance cartoon.